Rock School is the eight-part series that shows you how blues, heavy metal, funk, reggae, and new music are made and played. This program is a basic introduction to the series, and we'll also learn about equipment. So you want to be a rock and roll star? Well, here's where it all begins. Your instrument, your pickup, your amp. I don't care if you play guitar, bass, drums, keyboards, or even zither. You can never know too much about equipment. To this day, I'll walk into a music store and get dazzled by some hot new instrument or effect, and I'll take it home and discover that it's kind of a weak, wimped-out version of something that I already have. If that kind of thing happens to me. After 38 years as a musician, you don't have a chance, right? Wrong you'll have a better chance of dealing with that kind of thing after watching this program. You'll see how a guitar is actually made. You'll hear tips from super guitarist Gary Moore. You'll watch Rock School's resident drummer Jeff Nichols as he demonstrates heads, pedals, and cymbals. Lots of cymbals. And also, be sure to watch for a clip of my good friend Stanley Clark on bass. There goes the bell. It's time for Rock School. for years or you're just thinking of forming your first band then rock school is for you over the next eight weeks we're going to be looking at how the guitar the bass and the drums work together in a band context and we're going to be looking at the styles of blues rock heavy metal funk and reggae a lot of the musical ideas we're going to show you can be found in books but what books can't show you is how the individual instruments fit together to produce the overall sound and that's what rock school sets out to do not only will we be working out ideas here in the studio, we'll be looking at clips of bands in concert. We went out and interviewed one or two faces. They might be familiar to you. Here's somebody talking about how they started to play bass guitar. Actually, I didn't actually start playing bass until Roger joined. And I was so, um, you know, into playing with him. It was you know, a feeling that I'd never felt before. Um, that was what really made me decide. At one point when Roger was I was like playing guitar on one number and then playing bass on another one. But if you'd heard me play guitar, you'd know why I played, changed the bass. When forming a band, the most important thing is to have a good sound. And this depends on two things, your equipment and you. So let's begin by looking at the hardware. How will the gear shape your sound? First of all, the guitar. Just over 30 years ago, electric solid body guitars were developed and for a while they were marketed almost exclusively by two American companies, Fender and Gibson. Now, we went to find out what makes up the components of their guitars. This is one of many types of bodies that uh, this particular one will be slated for a Les Paul. You have two different types of wood incorporated into one body. The maple would more or less contribute to the brilliance, sustain, the high frequency. And the mahogany would relate more so to warmth, uh, the basic character of the uh, guitar tonality. So between the two, uh, this produces quite a unique sound. This is the last ball, okay. <coughs> this is a much sort of longer sustaining kind of sound. significant portion of the magic formula, so to speak, and commonly uh, these little items have been referred to as pickups, because in essence that's what they basically do, they pick up a signal. This particular pickup, which is called the humbucking pickup, 
was developed in the late 50s and uh, essentially took one of these single coils, which is a single piece of plastic with wire on it, and took two of them and placed them side by side, a north pole, south pole, if you will, and actually they're trying to cancel each other, so to speak. Humbucking basically means just that. Humbucking pickups buck hum or stop radiated noise or interference. These are very powerful pickups because these were the original 1959 Gibson patent applied for as they're now in pickups. And they've got a lot of uh, power in them, really. That's where you get that really long sort of thing. <laughs> to the feel that a person's going to have to work with. This fingerboard appears to be flat, but it's not. As you can see from the tail end, there's a curvature. And this particular curvature is a one foot radius. And that's critical to how the guitar will feel. This particular item we simply call a bridge. Uh, the basic function of a bridge is to adjust the height of the strings for easy playing action. And as important, if not more important, it's designed to intonate the instrument. String gauges being what they are today, everything from bob wire to uh, almost rubber bands, very slinky strings, you, you must have that ability to intonate the instrument. Once all these parts are put together, you've probably put three months' worth of work into this instrument. And after finishing, it becomes almost human. So the main components of the electric guitar are the neck, the bridge, the tuning heads, the body, and of course, the pickups. Now, a pickup is basically a magnet with copper coils wound around. When a metal string vibrates, the signal is converted into electricity in the coil and sent along to the lead, and then from the lead, it goes to the amplifier. We've already seen how the Gibson Les Paul uses the distinctive sound of the humbucking pickup. That is, two single coils connected together. Now, Fender guitars are much more associated with single coil pickups. We asked Gary Moore to demonstrate the range of sounds that you can get from these guitars. It's kind of like, if you, if you play a strap very quietly, it still gets very bright. It's not like a Les Paul where you turn it down and it gets kind of duller and duller. You can get a very sort of a funky sound, you know. You know, whereas the Les Paul has got more sort of a singing sound. Um, there's some nice things you can do with a Stratocaster. You can get like a sort of a, a forky sort of a sound by putting the, the toggle switch between the, the pickup positions. Well, that's the old way of doing it, but now, of course, you have five-way switches, but this is like one of the old ones, so that sort of uh, Mark Knopfler type thing. Well, that sort of sound. And you can also get a very jazzy tone from it, if you like, you know. But the, the classic sort of Strat sound is really that sort of biting to that. We've been looking at the design and development of electric guitars, and nowadays there's a whole range of good quality cheaper models on the market. Now, if we have a look at uh, one of these, hmm, this is very nice, um, but maybe we'll have a look at this one. No matter what price you're going to pay for a guitar, there are some features that you ought to look at. The first thing is to play the instrument. Make sure that all the notes are playing cleanly right up the neck. Check that there aren't any fret buzzers or rattles or things like this. 
perhaps you could notice the action. Now, the action is the height of the guitar strings above the fingerboard. If the action's too high, then you'll find that fretting notes and barring chords higher up the neck is actually extremely difficult. You ought to notice as well if the guitar's staying in tune, it's possible that the strings are new on it, so you can stretch them like this. If the strings keep slipping out of tune, you want to check that the machine heads aren't actually slipping. This could be quite an expensive thing to correct. Another thing connected with tuning is intonation. The guitar should be in tune the whole way up the neck. Now, the way to check this is to play a harmonic on the 12th fret like this, and then fret the note. Like this, and this. Now, these two notes should sound exactly the same. If they're not, then check to see that you can actually adjust the string length by moving the bridge saddles backwards and forwards. If you find that, the, that you have got buzzers or rattles or things like this, if the intonation is inaccurate, then look down the neck to make sure that you haven't got a warped or distorted neck. Now, if you look down the neck, you can see that all the frets should be smooth. Run your hands down each side to check this. The neck should look fairly straight, with possibly a very slight concave dip in the middle, like that. And finally, of course, you should check all the controls are working, try out the tone, the volume, the knobs, you know, everything. Click all the switches, so that when you buy a guitar, you know exactly what range of sounds that you can get from the instrument. Moving on now to the bass guitar, the main developments lie with the pickups and with active circuitry. Now, the bass sound is probably the hardest sound to get right on stage because the bass frequencies are usually covered up by other instruments. But now, with the addition of actives and uh, preamps inside the guitar, it's possible to go from a low, deep bass to a high, biting treble. One of the leading exponents for the use of the active is Stanley Clark. Another development for the bass guitar has been the fretless. And with this, you'll notice the neck is different. It's no frets, it's like a double bass, which enables you to hold notes for a long time, like this. It also enables you to slur notes. Along with the fretless, you can use effects like chorus pedals and phase pedals. Now, the leading exponent of the fretless bass is Jaco Pastorus, and the sort of lines that he thought of are now used in the music of Paul Young, Nick Haywood, Japan, and The Police. We're going to incorporate some of those sounds in this next piece of music. One, two. Mm -hmm. 